Onk Live Insights is a video editorial program produced by Onk Live. Let's talk a little, you just mentioned pomalidomide. Let's talk a little bit more about when you would or would not incorporate that agent. So for right now, the, you know, if you look at the pomalidomide label, uh, you can use pomalidomide if you've seen lenalidomide and a proteasome inhibitor like bortezomib before. If you look at some of the trials, a lot of the trials had enriched for patients who were refractory to lenalidomide and still responded to pomalidomide, or even refractory. For example, if you look at the MMO3 trial, which actually got pomalidomide its approval in Europe, 75% uh, of those patients were even refractory to bortezomib. Um, so certainly in refractory patients, pomalidomide is a great drug. But even so, if you've seen um, lenalidomide and bortezomib and have gotten maximal benefit out of that. I think going to pomalidomide is perfectly reasonable. Uh, pomalidomide in combination with dexamethasone is generally very well tolerated. And what we've learned with the IMIDs is as we've gone from thalidomide to lenalidomide and now pomalidomide, you know, we've either gotten better at managing the toxicities, but also more so, I do think the toxicity profile has improved with the emits. Um, you know, when we first started using thalidomide, we saw a lot of neuropathy. Uh, we saw a lot of constipation, and at that time, we were using much higher doses. When we went to lenalidomide, we didn't see any of uh, we saw a little bit of neuropathy, not a lot of constipation. And if you look at the doses we're using, it goes to speak to the potency of these drugs. We started with, you know, 100 and 200 on thalidomide. Lenalidomide is 25, and now with pomalidomide, we're using four, suggesting that we're getting to more potent compounds which are a little more specific, and some of the toxicities that you see may, in fact, be off-target toxicities. So coming to pomalidomide, it's generally extremely well-tolerated. The big toxicities that we encounter with uh, pomalidomide is myelosuppression. Uh, we Even skin rashes, which are a little more common with uh, lenalidomide, about 20-25% of people will have uh, the uh, skin rashes associated with uh, lenalidomide. You don't see that same incidence with pomalidomide. Neuropathy is seen, but again, it's much lower with pomalidomide. So, um, you know, it's generally extremely well tolerated. It's very convenient because it's oral, and uh, most of us start off using it at 4 milligrams. And depending on how patients are doing, you can always do so just. So earlier you mentioned uh, pomalidomide. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you use that agent and in what line. So pomalidomide is a drug that was recently approved among patients who are resistant to lenalidomide. Uh, pomalidomide is the third generation immunomodulatory drug. It's a pill. It's very well tolerated. Its most common side effects are suppression of the blood counts and sometimes fatigue. There is a risk of thrombosis with any of the imid class, but using appropriate, appropriate prophylaxis that can be reduced markedly. So pomalidomide is a drug that we've used a fair amount in the relapsed and refractory setting. Again, it tends to be in a LEN-resistant patient population. And again, the advantage of pomalidomide is that it's a pill. Patients can take it and come back and see you once a month or twice a month, depending upon their blood counts. And it's a relatively straightforward regimen to use. Uh, those two drugs uh, are the two newest agents that have been FDA approved for myeloma, and we use them uh, in the relapse refractory setting. So patients, uh, both of these drugs are used in very specific indications, a very specific pa patient population. Uh, these are patients who have had uh, prior therapies. Um, they have seen bortezomib in their past treatment history. They have seen an image for, uh, for pomalidomide. They have had to have seen lenalidomide. Um, and they are refractory to their last treatment, uh, treatment option. So they are either progressing right through that treatment or we stop treatment for some reason and within 60 days they have evidence of disease progression so they are considered refractory. And that's when we would consider using either of those agents uh, in that patient population. There's uh, many that we see and it really can be 
very specific to the agents that we're using to treat patients with refract or relapse refractory disease. Um, it, you know, fatigue is something that we see uh, very commonly, uh, regardless of the treatment option that we choose. Um, fatigue is also a disease-related, uh, unfortunately, a disease-related um, side effect. Fatigue can be related to uh, not just treatment, but some other things that we try to rule out, whether the patient be anemic, maybe uh, dehydrated, or uh, some, even some things like inactivity and depression can cause fatigue. But that seems to be a very common uh, side effect with treatments uh, in myeloma patients. We do see cytopenias. So we do see thrombocytopenia with the uh, uh, proteasome inhibitors. We do see some neutropenia with the immunomodulatory drugs. Uh, we do see some GI changes. Nausea and vomiting, not so much. Uh, we do see uh, bowel changes that are more frequent than the um, nausea kind of side effects. We do see some diarrhea and or constipation with some of these agents. Uh, we can see uh, peripheral neuropathy uh, in the, in, uh, the bortezomib setting. Uh, in thalidomide too, we can see a peripheral neuropathy, which is uh, uh, one of the challenging side effects. We do see an increased risk of blood clots, so we can uh, we have to be aware of that and manage that appropriately. But in general, many of these agents are very well tolerated, uh, and the patients know what to report to us. And when they report back to us and communicate with us, we can then manage appropriately uh, to keep them on therapy for you know extended periods of time. Neutropenia, I would say, is the most common hematologic toxicity. Um, very manageable. I mean, we do see patients on a frequent basis when they start pomalidomide therapy. Uh, our uh, policy in our cancer center is for the first two months, we do see them at, at least every other week, and, and most of the time we see them weekly. Uh, patients with relapse refractory disease usually are not coming to us with very good blood counts, so we do want to keep an eye on their blood counts. Um, it's, it's a very well-tolerated drug. We do see fatigue. Fatigue seems to be something we can't get away from for any of our uh, patients, with, regardless of the treatment option. Um, constipation and diarrhea to a lesser degree than some of the other agents. We have seen some rare cases with confusion, uh, but again, we are always uh, looking to rule out other etiologies for any kind of neurological symptom um, in, in this patient population before we attribute it to the drug. Um, these patients are heavily pretreated usually. Some of them have pre-existing neuropathy, so we are looking for any exacerbation of neuropathy in all of our patients. But in general, pomalidomide is a very well-tolerated uh, agent in this setting. Well, grade three is a 1,000 ANC and grade four is a 500 ANC. Uh, the percentage, I couldn't give you a percentage right off the top of my head, but we do see it quite frequently. Um, I would say that we probably see grades one and two more frequently than three and four, but we do see grades three and four. This is, again, very manageable. I think what we do as an institution, as a division, I mean, uh, is we do monitor patients frequently. So patients know that they have to get frequent checks of their blood counts, uh, and they, we do support them if we have to give them uh, growth factors. Uh, for cases with thrombocytopenia, we do you know, transfuse them if necessary. Um, so we're very aggressive in our management of cytopenias. We feel that uh, with any drug, it's a risk versus benefit analysis. So patients who have relapse refractory disease need to stay on treatment. So we would like to manage them through these cycles and keep them on the agent for a long period of time. We have dose-reduced pomalidomide. Um, we typically like to start at four milligrams. Uh, we have dose reduced. Um, not many of our patients are under uh, three milligrams. Many of our patients are on four, and three, four milligrams or three milligrams, but we have dose reduced for a persistent, cytopen persistent neutropenia is usually the case. Um, but in general, patients are able to stay on their full dose therapy. We, um, we were involved in many of the clinical trials for pomalidomide, so we did have to um, discontinue based on the guidelines as dictated in the clinical trial. We do discontinue uh, pomalidomide, but most of our patients, the discontinuation is due to disease progression and not really uh, an intolerable toxicity. All of our patients, every single patient who's on a uh, imid-containing regimen, and that would be include pomalidomide, they are all on anticoagulation prophylaxis. Uh, the actual agent that we use depends on the presentation of that patient. So if a patient is a relatively low risk for blood clots, typically our regimen is aspirin, and it's a baby aspirin, so it would be 81 milligrams daily. 
Um, we do use warfarin. We have used low molecular weight heparin. We've used uh, the injections. We also now use um, Xeralto, uh, a newer agent that helps prevent blood clots. Um, so we do. Every patient who's on any kind of imid-containing regimen will be using anticoagulation prophylaxis. Despite that, we do see some blood clots, but the rate is very low. It's 3% uh, or less of patients will develop blood clots uh, while being on these uh, medications to prevent blood clots.